it's common to represent the structure of thrust systems on individual cross sections, but actually thrust systems are complicated three-dimensional structures. We'll have a look at the complexity of a single thrust fault, looking at its ramp geometries in three dimensions, using concepts of cut-off lines to explore their orientation. We'll then move on to look at multiple thrusts and how these relate to one another using branch lines. We can set the scene here using the example from the Laramide thrust systems in the Wyoming-Idaho segment of North America. We won't worry too much about the bedrock geology, let's just look at the fault trace on here. So here are the faults, they're chiefly thrust faults. Let's pick out one of them and notice as it wanders across the map how it changes in trend. We'd like to explain these changes. But if we add other faults onto here, we can see that they form complicated branching patterns. The individual thrusts link together. So there are two separate issues here that we need to think about if we want to develop 3D understanding of these linked systems. So let's deal with a single thrust. So here we are, the standard view in cross-section where we have a thrust running along a flat, climbing a ramp, and moving on to an upper flat. And as a consequence, we generate an anticline in the hanging wall. Well, let's strip off that hanging wall to reveal the foot wall ramp, and then reveal this in three dimensions. So this is a single thrust with just its foot wall exposed. So we're seeing how a thrust ramp may change its orientation. Let's put on the hanging wall here just to remind ourselves of the geometry. So the fault slip is from right to left. So let's look down on the fault plane again, and these are the slip directions that the hanging wall will impose on the foot wall as it has moved over this geometry. It's fairly simple to understand on the flats, but let's look at what happens on the ramps. First of all, there are two segments on here where the thrust displacement is dip-slip. These are called frontal ramps. There's another part of this fault geometry where the slip on the ramp is strike slip. These are called lateral ramps. And then there's a part of the structure in between frontal and lateral, and these are oblique ramps where the slip is oblique. The thrust direction is constant, but it's the orientation of the ramps that change to create this three-dimensional fault surface. We can pick out these variations by thinking about the line of intersection between one of the beds in the foot wall and the fault surface at the ramp. So let's think about that between the yellow and blue horizons in here and where they intersect the fault plane forms this line here. It's called a cutoff line. It's in the foot wall. It's the foot wall cutoff line and it changes trend through the ramps. So now let's consider the hanging wall. So let's put this hanging wall block back on for this side of the diagram and put a bit more on on this side over here. Notice that the leading edge of the hanging wall ramp apparently is offset. So let's put on the foot wall cutoff line that we've just considered. And we can see now that the piece of the hanging wall that we've retained on our diagram has got the matching hanging wall cutoff shown in blue where it's been displaced from originally connecting with the foot wall. So this is the hanging wall cutoff line. We can do the same thing on the other side of the structure there. The hanging wall cutoff line will mimic the trend of the foot wall cutoff line. And if displacement is conserved, it will simply be parallel to the foot wall cutoff line and offset by that displacement. Let's fill in the rest of the hanging wall fold shape. Here we go. This is the fold hanging wall. The hanging wall cutoff line will lie beneath this fold structure. And we can see it poking out at the ends of the model. Notice that the hanging wall anticline crest follows the shape of the hanging wall ramp. So the ramp geometry controls the surface expression of the thrust sheet. Well, we can explore this by using a natural example that's really dramatic from the Himalayan thrust front in Pakistan. Here we go. So we're stood above the foreland area, looking back into the thrust belt, and we can see the rather complicated shape of the thrust front. In fact, it splays a bit in the middle part of the image. Let's strip away the thrust interpretation for a minute to get some places in the scale. 
So we're looking at an area called the Salt Range and Transindus Ranges, and we can see that there's a reentrant there that's about 100 kilometers deep, so it's a pretty big area, this. The thrusting direction is shown by these arrows carrying the main Himalayan chain out into the foreland. So let's strip away the thrust sheet and think about the shape of the detachment and the associated ramp which localises the thrust front. Here we go. So there's a big flat represented by the pink area there by which the thrust belt is detached and the mountain front is controlled by the ramp geometry which is highly irregular. We can recognise frontal ramps where the angle of incidence between the trend of the ramp and the thrusting direction is orthogonal. And we can also recognise some lateral ramps where the thrust direction is pretty much parallel to the trend of the ramps. So let's mix back on the thrust sheet. And we can see that the trend of the ramps has controlled the line of hills which is picking out the anticline formed along the mountain front. So ramp geometry controls the surface expression of the thrust sheet. So if you looked at changes in trend, changes in ramp orientation for a single thrust. But what about multiple thrusts? Well here's a cross section of part of the my thrust belt and we can see that thrusts really come on their own. They form a branching network. So let's explore this geometry using an idealized setup inspired by this type of cross-section. We've got an orange thrust sheet running over the top and we've got a small thrust slice carried along with it. So we're only really dealing with two thrusts. And these isolate a thrust-bound slice, a horse. Let's try and strip this model away and we'll strip off the thrust sheet on top and the horse to reveal the ultimate footwalls of all of this. Here we go. So this is just the lower footwall. Here's the thrust plane. And we can see, as we saw before, that the top of the yellow abuts against this thrust in the footwall. So this is a footwall cutoff line. Just to remind ourselves, we can put the thrust slice on now and identify the yellow bed in here. And we can see the hanging wall cutoff line and its matching footwall cutoff line. So now let's put on the overriding thrust sheet. So here's our thrust bound slice. And we can see that the leading edge of that slice is defined by where the two thrusts come down together and join, and the trailing edge similarly defined by where the two thrusts combine again. These are called branch lines. There they go. The one at the front is called a leading branch line, the one at the back is a trailing branch line, and they limit the extent of the horse towards the front and the back. So our cross-section from the mine thrust belt shows lots of thrust bound slices. They all are limited front and back by their own branch lines. Collectively, this is a duplex structure. But this diagram is somewhat simplified. We've seen that thrusts have irregular shapes in 3D with frontal, oblique and lateral ramps, but also the individual thrusts don't go on forever, they join up. We see this on the map for the wine thrust belt from which that cross section came from. And as we look at all those thrusts in the thick black lines, we can see that they can join up to create a web. Let's try and look at the geometry of this. So again, let's try and set this up with an overriding thrust sheet running up a foot wall ramp. And we're going to go into three dimensions. So here's a block diagram showing this thrust sheet with the ramp. Let's just strip the thrust sheet away. So here is this ramp, and it's a simple frontal ramp. So in order to create a new thrust slice in the foot wall to this overriding thrust, we have to isolate a piece from this block diagram with a new thrust. So let's say that this is where the new thrust begins to grow and it isolates out a slice like this to recombine with the thrust sheet. So this is a horse about to move. Let's take it away to look through the horse into the new ramp structure that is created so that trough in the image there now represents a slice of rock that will be glued onto our thrust sheet and moved away as displacement continues. It has its own cutoff line where the top of the yellow bed comes against this new fault surface. So let's put the horse back in again, yet to move. We're going to move it now. So let's give it somewhere to go. 
it's going to move up onto the continuous upper flat. Off it goes like that. It's quite difficult to visualize. What we're looking at there is the thrust slice and the excavated gap left behind as it's been carried away, glued onto the thrust sheet that we're not showing. Within the thrust slice, the yellow bed comes down against the fault plane to create a hanging wall cutoff line, leaving behind a fault wall cutoff in the hole left behind. So we have a hanging wall cutoff line and a fault wall cutoff line. But if we look at the thrust slice over on the left, we've got a red line that delimits its extent. This is where the thrust that carries this little slice joins the overriding thrust. This is the branch line, and it forms a continuous loop, as we can see, in 3D. Let's put our thrust sheet back on top. Right, so it's quite difficult to visualize all this in three dimensions, so let's try and simplify it a little bit and think about how we would encounter this geometry in a series of boreholes. Here they are. So four boreholes tracking across the structure. What would these encounter? So we can describe these from left to right. So starting on the left, we have our pink overriding thrust sheet sitting on the common foot wall, running along a thrust flat. Moving right, our borehole goes through the overriding thrust sheet, then encounters our small horse, crossing the upper thrust to it, and then goes through that, crossing its lower thrust, and then into the common foot wall. Go to the Next borehole, so that's number three in from the left, we go through the overriding thrust sheet and again into the common foot wall. And then finally, on the right hand side, this borehole's gone through the area from which our little thrust slice has come from, so the strip of green and yellow rocks is not encountered in this well, rather the overriding thrust sheet lies on the lowermost rock in our succession. So we can join this all up. We can see we have our overriding thrust sheet in pink over everything and a foot wall panel that runs underneath and a little isolated thrust slice seen in the second borehole bound at the front, isolated because the fault that is above and below it merge both towards the left and the right and these points of merger are branch lines. It's the leading branch line on the left and the training branch line at the back. So these are the key elements for understanding thrust structures in three dimensions. Maps of cutoff lines and of branch lines. The cutoff lines represent the geometry of ramps. The branch lines tell us about how thrusts join together. So that's a brief look at the geometry of linked thrust systems in three dimensions. We've looked at the geometry of single thrusts and for multiple thrusts. In practice, constructing branch lines and cutoff lines requires good maps, ideally assisted with well data, and the ability to draw serial cross sections to identify their positions and join up geometry. If you do that, you can get a working understanding of the three-dimensional structure of thrust systems.